Well, thank you for that generous introduction and for the um, invitation to speak today. I feel like I'm kind of the opening band of the big rock star <laughs> later on. But um, so let's see, make sure I can run my slides here. So uh, just an overview of my presentation. I'm going to be describing some of our research that I've done with Sarah showing current gaps in treatment for opioid use disorders and hepatitis C among persons who inject drugs. And then I'd like to introduce to you an ongoing study, the HERO study, that compares models of care for hepatitis C treatment among persons who inject drugs. So these are my disclosures. I am the co-investigator of this PCORI funded study, the HERO study, that I'll describe later. And for that study, Gilead has provided medications and also some uh, funding for pharmacy dispensing. I'm also the recipient of a small business innovation research grant from NIDA, and that uh, provides a partnership with a health technology company called Umoka. Um, and we're looking at the feasibility of a smartphone app to improve adherence to office-based buprenorphine treatment. And I was hoping to de um, describe that study as well, but there simply isn't enough time within the 20, uh, 20 25 minutes. So a little bit of background on hepatitis C and injection drug use, which I'm sure will be very familiar to this audience. Um, hepatitis C was first identified in 1988. Um, the prevalence in the United States is estimated um, at 1%, and so that translates into about 2.7 million individuals who are infected. Hepatitis C uh, is a disease that is primarily transmitted through injection drug use, at least in the United States and many other developed countries. And if you look at the NHANES data, um, the uh, injection drug use is this very strong risk factor. The odds ratio is 149 um, for hepatitis C. Um, and so the prevalence in uh, injection drug users of hepatitis C in North, um, in, uh, North America is estimated at 73%. So it's a very common uh, infection among people who inject drugs. In contrast, the prevalence of HIV is um, much lower, estimated about 15% in North America. In the U.S., the prevalence of hepatitis C um, has been the highest among individuals who were born in between 1945 and 1965. So this is the baby boomer cohort, uh, individuals who were young adults in the 1970s and 80s and experimented with injecting drugs at that time. However, the epidemiology of hepatitis C has been changing over the past decade. So in the past decade, there's been this emergence of new cases among young adults and also cases in rural areas in the United States, which had previously seen few cases. And what can we attribute this to? So this is really being driven by this epidemic of opioid use disorders that's going on across the country. So this figure is showing data from 1999 to um, 2009, and you can see that there's been this great rise in um, sales of opioids, and concurrently, there's been a rise in overdose deaths um, and in treatment admissions for opioids. So unfortunately, HIV and hepatitis C are other complications of uh, this epidemic of opioid use disorders. And I'm sure you're probably aware of this case, which was sort of a stark reminder of what's going on across the country. Um, in 2015, there was a small county in Indiana, Scott County, that announced that they had seen um, a large number of cases. So in total, they reported 135 cases in this small rural community of 4,200 individuals. And all the cases, uh, nearly all the cases reported that they had injected prescription opioids and heroin. So the good news really is that we have effective medications that can treat both opioid use disorders and hepatitis C. So medications for treating opioid use disorders have been shown to decrease craving and elicit opiate use. And we have a number of different medications available. There's the class of drugs, uh, which are the opioid agonist therapy. So we have buprenorphine and methadone. And in addition, we also have opioid receptor antagonists, namely naltrexone, which is available both as an oral short-acting formulation and uh, extended release um, injectable. So buprenorphine does have some advantages. 
um, over methadone being a partial ag agonist. It has a better side effect profile, causes uh, less sedation, less overdose risk, and um, theoretically less withdrawal as well. So the FDA approved buprenorphine in 2002 to be prescribed in office space settings. So any uh, pr uh, provider who was wavered um, could prescribe in an office space setting, which is an improvement over methadone, which can only be dispensed in a federally regulated OTP setting. So in a theory, this should improve access to treatment for opioid use disorders. However, I'll show you some uh, data later to suggest that it hasn't exactly turned out this way. Opioid agonist therapy has also been shown to be associated with lower incidence of hepatitis C and HIV among persons who inject drugs. And I conducted a study with um, colleagues in San Francisco at UCSF where we looked at um, the effects of opioid agonist therapy on incident hepatitis C and in injection drug users. So we use data from the UFO cohort, which is a cohort of young injection drug users uh, which were followed in San Francisco for more than a decade. And um, the uh, cohort included individuals who were uninfected, who were followed uh, quarterly and tested for new uh, hepatitis C. And we found that indeed uh, self-report of recently receiving opioid agonist therapy was associated with a more than 60% reduction in incidence of hepatitis C over time. And we, um, at the time that we published this paper, there were two other papers that came out in other countries, in Canada and Australia, which showed similar protective results. So the data is fairly robust to suggest that opioid agonist therapy does have protective effects against uh, hepatitis C incidence. So the other good news is that we have a lot of medications uh, to treat hepatitis C. So the, these new medications called the directly acting antiviral medications, or DAAs, have really transformed hepatitis C treatment. The first medication, Sofosfavir, came out in 2013, and now we have multiple different regimens that are available. So now nearly all patients can be cured of hepatitis C with eight to 12 weeks of oral medications with very few side effects. So this really has transformed the clinical landscape. And elimination of hepatitis C is now both a national priority and also a global priority. The guidelines now recommend treating all patients um, with chronic hepatitis C. And indeed, they also recognize the need to specifically target people who inject drugs in order to interrupt the forward transmission and decrease incidence over time. So the question remains, we have effective medications, both for opioid use disorders and for hepatitis C, but do people who inject drugs have access to these medications? So the first study I'll describe, um, conducted with Sarah Glick here, um, looked at the utilization of buprenorphine and methadone among opioid users who inject drugs. So we used local data from the CDC National HIV Behavioral Surveillance System, or NHBS, that was conducted in 2015. So this is an annual survey that's conducted among HIV risk groups, and every three years it's focused on um, persons who inject drugs. So the national survey included a single question on drug treatment. It asked, in the past 12 months, have you received any drug treatment, and it listed um, everything from 12-step groups to inpatient rehab. But interestingly, there were no specific questions on OAT. So for the local questionnaire, we added questions asking if um, participants had received treatment with either methadone or buprenorphine in the previous 12 months. And so the sample were adults who were in the Seattle metropolitan area, since these questions were only administered in the local survey. Uh, who had injected drugs in the past year and also had reported opioid use because we wanted to restrict individuals who um, were really eligible for these medications. So this is what we found. We found uh, that in the sample of 487 participants who reported injection drug use and opioid use, that the majority, 70%, had not received methadone or buprenorphine treatment within the past year. 
27% reported that they had been treated with methadone in the past year. However, 15% had tried to get in treatment with methadone, but they were unable. A very small percentage, 4.7%, uh, reported that they had been treated with buprenorphine in the past year, and nearly double the amount said that they had tried to get into treatment with buprenorphine, but they were unable. So the, so the data really do suggest there are some major treatment gaps, particularly for buprenorphine. So we also asked participants um, who reported having been treated how long they were treated for. And so this slide shows the duration of treatment for both methadone and buprenorphine. And interestingly, the individuals who reported they, they had been on methadone, the majority of them were on it for more than six months. So indeed, they were receiving the standard therapy, which is maintenance therapy. However, individuals who reported receiving buprenorphine, the majority of them had taken it only for three months or less. So this really suggests that there are some serious adherence and retention issues uh, with buprenorphine treatment for the sample. However, I will caution that it was only 22 individuals who reported treatment with buprenorphine. So um, need to take that into consideration. So the second study is also using data from the same data set. Um, and this we've not published yet, so I'm just going to be showing you preliminary results. So we also added specific questions about hepatitis C uh, treatment um, with DEAs and also barriers to treatment. The national survey included questions about testing, and the national survey also included testing, so all participants were screened with an antibody test. So for this study, we used all the participants in the sample, so adults um, in the Seattle metropolitan area who injected drugs within the past year. And so we we're primarily interested in the continuum of care in this population. So this slide shows the hepatitis C care continuum among the Seattle persons who inject drugs using this data from 2015. So as you can see, um, the majority of the sample of 525 individuals had uh, reported that they had ever been tested for hepatitis C. So 84% had uh, received uh, at least one test. Of those who said that they had been tested, 60% of them believed that they were infected, were told that they had um, infection. And then if we look at the results from the actual testing that was provided within the study, 66% of those individuals had a positive screening test. So um, and keep in mind about 25% of people who are exposed will spontaneously clear. So it's probably about three quarters of those who had a chronic infection. But, um, you know, so those numbers that reported being um, diagnosed with hepatitis C and actually did have a positive screening test um, were not so far off. I think giving us a sense that we are perhaps doing an okay job um, at doing screening for hepatitis C among people who inject drugs. So then we asked these local questions to the individuals who believed that they had hepatitis C, self-reported the diagnosis. 77% of those individuals had actually heard of new DEA treatments, which I was quite surprised about. Um, the DEAs came out in 2013, and this survey was conducted in 2015. So actually, I think that's a um, pretty rapid dissemination of information about these new medications, and maybe gives you a sense of this community and how um, information can uh, be spread. However, when we looked at treatment, the questions around treatment, um, sadly, there was still a huge gap. So only 16% of those who were infected um, had ever been treated with medication, and only 6% reported being treated with DEAs uh, specifically. Oops. So then looking a little bit at what were some of the barriers to treatment that participants reported. Um, most individuals said that they were, they would be interested in getting new treatments for hepatitis C. Um, however, 15 of the participants, 6%, said that they wanted to get treatment, but they were unable to. 
And when we ask them sort of reasons why they were unable to get treated, the three top reasons were that they didn't have a regular doctor, the doctor said that treatment wasn't needed yet, or saw a hepatitis C specialist but not offered treatment due to drug use. So this does match the literature to date. We do know that many providers will not prescribe DEAs to persons who inject drugs. There was a study of specialist hepatitis C providers um, that was conducted at the um, AAFLD meeting. So this is the Association um, for Liver Disease. And that study found that only 15% of the providers surveyed said that they would be willing to prescribe DAs to active persons who inject drugs. And you might think this might be a sort of more academic, enlightened sample. Of those who were surveyed who said they were unwilling to prescribe to people who were actively injecting drugs, they cited adherence, reinfection, and cost as major reasons. So what do we know about adherence and cure rates and reinfection? Uh, for people with hepatitis C um, who inject drugs who are treated with DAs. So the studies to date suggest that there may be um, equivalent cure rates among uh, people who inject drugs. However, the data are really limited to clinical trials and um, usually the samples that have been included are persons who have in ever injected drugs and many of them are um, in treatment. Um, so really we need more information from real world settings. Similarly, um, for re reinfection rates, it's, a lot of the data comes from the pre-DEA era and um, we don't have a lot of real world information. So there's a real need, I think, to develop and test models of care to both expand access to these needed medications, both DEAs and to OAT and to optimize adherence among people who inject drugs so they can have successful treatment outcomes. Also, we need, need more data from the real world setting to understand barriers to adherence and also whether or not adherence truly impacts outcomes among people who inject drugs. Um, as you know, the medications are highly effective and it may, may not matter so much anymore how adherent patients are. So the HERO study is a study which hopes to provide some information. HERO stands for the Hepatitis C Real Options Study. It's a national study that's funded by P. Corey. Um, the PI is uh, Alan Litwin. And we are enrolling 1,000 current injection drug users defined as having injected within the past three months and assume that um, 600 will initiate treatment with once daily sofosfavir velpatosphere for 12 weeks. The enrollments are occurring both at community health center sites and also at methadone treatment programs. And the outcomes that will be evaluated are initiation, adherence, completion of treatment, sustained virologic response, which is the definition of cure, resistance, rein and reinfection. So participants will be followed for two years after they complete treatment. There were many stakeholders, both, both on the local and international level, that were involved in the design and implementation of this study. So this is a study design. The study is comparing two different models of care. It's comparing a modified directly observed therapy model um, to a patient navigation model. So the modified directly observed therapy in the methadone uh, clinic consists of having the medications for hepatitis C be dispensed along with the methadone. In the community health center setting, it consists of using a smartphone app um, that allows patients to upload videos of themselves taking their medications to confirm um, uh, that they've taken them. So the patient navigation um, is implemented slightly differently at different sites. Here at our site, um, it's not through peers, it's through case managers who are provided through the Hepatitis Education Project. However, um, patient navigation, they use the same protocol at all the sites. It's a protocol called Check Hep C that was developed in New York City. So patients with chronic hepatitis C get randomized to one of these two interventions. 
they have 12 weeks to initiate treatment. Um, and then treatment is for 12 weeks. And then they're followed every 12 weeks thereafter um, with questionnaires and also laboratory testing. So this is just um, to let you know who our partners are. Um, we're enrolling both from Harborview Medical Center, from the Adult Medicine Clinic, where we have a large buprenorphine program. Also from the Madison Clinic, um, we're enrolling co-infected patients in the Max Clinic. And then we are enrolling at Evergreen Treatment Services, which is one of the largest OTPs um, in Seattle and Washington State. And again, I said Hepatitis Education Project has been um, one of our uh, collaborators and provided the patient navigation. So I'm pleased to say that we're nearly at our target enrollment. Um, each site is supposed to treat 75 patients. And we've so far treated 70, so we're just looking for five more. Um, but as you can see, this has been a huge effort at all the sites. So in total, we've screened um, 1,688 patients, and in total, um, treatment has been initiated in over 500 patients, which I think is really um, a huge accomplishment. So unfortunately, I can't provide any data from the study, but I can tell, give you this quote of what um, one patient said. I can't tell how grateful I am to the team of nurses, doctors, and HERO staff that convinced me that treatment was the way to go. I would admit I'm not very responsible when it comes to taking medication, so having the support of the HERO Teamsters, it made my journey to a healthier and better lifestyle that much easier. I used to think it was going to be a major inconvenience having to take all sorts of medication and all. However, it turns out it's only one pill for several weeks and then follow-ups thereafter which is not much to put up with considering we're talking about your health. So um, don't worry, I'm not gonna go into this. This is just to give you a sense of all the measurements that we're doing. This really is a very intensive study. So um, there's all sorts of questionnaires, um, validated measurement tools. Um, in addition, we have blood draws at nearly all the visits. Um, and it's also an invitation for uh, researchers out there who would like to use this data as well. We are also establishing a biorepository with the blood samples. And some of the plasma is going to be set aside for resistance testing for treatment failures, and the rest will be banked. So there are um, plenty of opportunities there as well. So in summary, access to medications for opioid use disorders and hepatitis C is suboptimal for persons who inject drugs. Among the Seattle area um, persons who inject drugs, only 30% reported past year treatment with OAT and only 16% reported ever being treated for hepatitis C. So research is needed to establish models of care to improve access and adherence to medications for both of these conditions. And the HERO study, which is comparing different models of care, will hopefully provide valuable information on relationships between adherence and hepatitis C treatment outcomes among people who inject drugs. So now open to questions. <laughs> Laura. Yes, it was. So in fact, I didn't show that data, but we, we also asked about illicit buprenorphine use. And um, unsurprisingly, the majority said that they had used it illicitly. Um, and we know that. And, and we also asked them why they used it. Most of them said they used it to treat their withdrawal symptoms. So there's a lot of self-medication going on um, because there's not a lot of access to providers and prescribers. So. Um, so this data is separate from that. That this is this is prescribed buprenorphine, yeah. And I should say, you know, certainly the Medicaid um, restrictions around buprenorphine treatment did change considerably. So I think it was difficult to treat patients, especially for extended periods, as far as I understand. So some of that that may reflect um, providers prescribing, you know, that was that was restricted by those guidelines as well. Yes. Thanks. 
I guess the question is, when are we doing this? It's not, it's not surprising that in our universe, in this particular planet, it's going to be the end of the planet. Flying saucers are going to be out there, and it's possibly in the end of the world. Uh, it's put on the planet, and it's going to be going to uh, the planet. Uh, I'm sure that. Um, so I suspect that my colleague Sarah may address this in her talk, um, and you are exactly, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to turf that to her. No, not exactly. Um, so, I mean, I do, I don't know if um, you saw the most recent issue of CID, Clinical Infectious Diseases. Um, there were some articles about Netherlands. They've been very aggressive in opening um, treatment, providing access to treatment for MSM, for hepatitis C, and they've actually seen on a population level um, impact that the, the incidence has gone down. So it's sort of example of, um, you know, it's evidence of treatment as prevention for hepatitis C, which we've been needing evidence for that for some time. Um, so I think in er other areas of the country where um, sexual transmission is one of the major risk factors, um, clearly that will need to be uh, targeted and addressed. To be honest, I think that there's a lot of, again, I think Sarah's going to touch on this, often there's a lot of overlap between the drug and the sex risks. Um, and so um, uh, I think, you know, certainly, right. Right. And we, I mean, I think we'll get valuable data from this study, too. We certainly have enrolled um, MSM through this study, and we are looking for reinfections, and we'll be able, and we're quantifying sexual behaviors as well as drug risk behaviors, and we'll be able to see um, sort of if there are reinfections that occur um, to, on that basis. Say it again. Oh, in Russia. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so in Russia, so I've done work in St. Petersburg. My mentor, um, Jeffrey Samet, has a cohort of HIV infected um, drug users that have been followed for a long time, for up to a decade. And so, as you may know, in, in Russia, um, in Eastern Europe that HIV is um, largely driven by injection drug use. Although I think there's a lot of talk about bridging and um, crossover now, but um, unfortunately in Russia, opioid agonist therapy is not available and there's very little harm reduction in the way of um, syringe service programs. So um, yeah, so it's, it's I think a, a, a challenging place to um, be a provider who wants to sort of provide treatment for people who use drugs. Um, I don't know what else you want me to say. <laughs> um, it's, it's a good place to study HIV among <laughs> injection drug users, as you might imagine, or there's many opportunities um, to study transmission. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Great. Our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Glick. Uh, Dr. Glick is a research assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. She's an epidemiologist involved in research, public health practice, and teaching in the School of Public Health. Her research focuses on the epidemiology of HIV, hepatitis C, and other comorbidities associated with injection drug use. She leads several projects at Public Health Gallatin County, including the NHDS, National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Project here, and the Hepatitis C Elimination Project. Dr. Glick received her PhD in Epi from UW and was then an assistant professor at George Washington University prior to us being 
very fortunate to have her return here to the University of Washington at Public Health Gallatin County in 2015. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's so nice to be able to present um, with Judy today, since as she described, we've been working on some projects together. And as uh, Julie explained, I, I really wear two hats, one in the health department as an epidemiologist there, and the other as a UW researcher. So I think and hope my talk today conveys um, both of those themes. Of course, as you all know, injection drug use was first, um, or was one of the first behaviors identified as being associated with HIV risk in the 1980s. And HIV can be pretty efficiently transmitted through sharing drug injection equipment between HIV positive and negative folks. Therefore, HIV harm reduction has largely focused on trying to provide clean and sterile injection equipment to people who inject, largely through syringe exchange programs, or SEPs which have been shown in numerous studies to reduce the risk of HIV. As Judy mentioned, we are, of course, in the midst of an opioid epidemic in the United States, as well as um, here in Seattle. And appropriately, most of our public health efforts have been focused on overdose and monitoring and preventing that. But HIV remains a threat. This is a picture from the Scott County um, outbreak. I was at a CDC meeting last week and heard that the number of new um, HIV diagnoses is up over 200 at this point. And that's about the same number of cases that we see here in King County in any given year. But this was in a population of 4,000 people. So, so there's certainly the potential there. And fortunately, here in King County, we have not yet seen any uptick in our new HIV diagnoses among people who inject drugs. I'm sort of spoiling my own talk here by telling you that. But um, I'm here to tell you that there's still potential for this to happen. Um, as I look out in the room, I know a lot of you work with this population, but some of you might not. So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to tell you more about what our health department does to monitor the health of people who inject drugs, including HIV. So that'll be my first aim today. Then I wanted to highlight some of the recent trends in drug use that we've observed among people who inject drugs, and then talk about some research I've done that documents and demonstrates the potential for HIV risk, particularly among people who are using methamphetamine um, who are not MSM. And then finally, um, use this opportunity to talk a little bit more about some other comorbidities and risk behaviors um, in this population, some of which Judy already mentioned. So first, let's talk about our health um, department surveillance system. So we really have three key surveillance systems that we use to monitor this population. The first is our core HIV surveillance system at the health department. In Washington state, AIDS was the first um, uh, mandatory reportable disease in 1984. This has shifted over time, and now all new HIV diagnoses in laboratories are reported to our health department. Among many other categories that people can be assigned for their risk, um, our health department staff um, investigate each of these diagnoses, and some people will be identified as being a person who injects drugs or an MSM who also injects drugs. The second system is the um, system that Judy talked about in her talk, the NHBS IDU survey. We've been um, participating in the CDC-funded project for over a decade, or actually over 12 years now, and we've completed four of the IDU cycles. We, we recruit about 500 people each cycle. We use an incentivized peer referral system called um, respondent-driven sampling, and people need to have reported injection drug use in the past year and also show evidence of, of use. We collect really detailed behavioral data from these folks, and we also conduct rapid HIV and hepatitis C screening. Finally, um, I want to talk about our third system, which is our syringe exchange program um, survey that we conduct every two years and, and have been doing so since 2003. Um, I'll be presenting mostly data from 2009 forward. It's basically a mini NHBS. It's cheaper and faster and easier. Um, we also recruit about 500 people. Um, we use the convenience sampling strategy, though, so basically everyone who comes through the door over a two-week period. And as I mentioned, we conduct a very brief survey with these folks and no HIV or hepatitis C screening. So first, I want to show you the, the core surveillance data. Um, in the chart on the left, you can see the number of new HIV diagnoses among people who inject drugs stratified by those who also report being an MSM and those who are not. And you can see um, there's been a convergence over time. And over the past five years, we've had relatively few new cases. Um, in 2016, which is the year for which we have the, the most complete data, there were 15 new diagnoses among PWID who are MSM and 11 new cases among other PWID, the 26th in 2016. And I've been told that the 2017 data are not much different. So um, there hasn't been an uptick since then. 
For HIV prevalence, of course, it's hard to get a denominator for these groups. We don't have a systematic way to, to measure the size of these populations, so our health department attempts to do this each year. And if we take those numbers, what we estimate is that roughly 15 to 22 percent of TWID who are MSM are HIV infected. That goes up to 40 percent among men who inject meth and are MSM. So that's where our really high concentration of HIV is among people who inject drugs here. This is in contrast to a fairly low prevalence, 1 to 3 percent, among other people who inject drugs, which is in contrast to what Judy said, our national estimate is around 15 percent. And just for some comparison, in King County, we estimate that about 11 percent of MSM are HIV positive. We're happy that we have pretty high rates of viral suppression here in King County, so um, that extends to people who inject drugs, um, just under 80 percent of MSM and under 75 percent of non-MSM. My second aim today, then, is to talk about drug trends in this population. And these data come from our four most recent surveys from our syringe exchange program, where we asked people which drugs they injected in the past, or sorry, which drugs they used in the past three months, which could include both injection and non-injection drugs. And I wanted to show you the data from our three most commonly reported drugs, as well as fentanyl. Um, so clearly, these add up to more than 100%. So there's a lot of poly drug use going on here in King County. Um, our heroin use rate has been pretty constant over time, around 83 percent, but where you can see the dramatic increases is among people using methamphetamine. Both people reporting just using methamphetamine at all, 75 percent, so almost approaching the rates of heroin. And then if we look at goofballs, which is a slang term for people who co-inject methamphetamine and heroin together, we see that raising in parallel um, with methamphetamine. And then given the interest in fentanyl use, we started asking about that in 2017. And 13% of people um, reported knowing that they had used fentanyl in the past three months. And for those of you who aren't aware of fentanyl, this has been linked to very high levels of overdose, opioid overdose, um, largely in Vancouver, British Columbia, as well as parts of the eastern United States. So given that uptick in methamphetamine overall, we were really interested in who is using meth. And as I mentioned before, we are really concerned about the high prevalence of HIV among men who have sex with men who inject meth. And so our question was, are um, the networks of people using methamphetamine um, bridging? Or could there be potential overlap, which would introduce the potential for transmission risk into populations that hadn't necessarily been at HIV risk before? So what we did here is I basically stratified the data from the previous slide. Um, so focusing on MSM, who inject drugs, very high proportions of them report using methamphetamine. This wasn't necessarily surprising to us, right? We, we knew that there, were, um, there was a lot of meth use in this population. There's been a slight uptick over time, though. But when we look at them among the non-MSM, this is where we see the dramatic increase. So this is where the new meth use is really concentrated. Also add from the EPI surveillance perspective, I think it's really interesting how the the data from these two surveys are so similar. There is some difference, right? The NHPS data tend to be um, higher risk because this is a population that we're recruiting from the, the community, not just a really harm reduction center. But the trends overall are almost always in parallel, which I think lends a lot of validity to our conclusions that we can make about the trends. We think they're real. So I also want to step back and talk a little bit more about goofball use, since this has also been really new to us, at least. Um, so these data are basically um, the same chart I just showed you, but I've converted it to a bar chart, and I've restricted it to our syringe exchange program data. And that's because the, that program has had um, the foresight to be asking about goofballs for many years, unlike NHBS. So these data here show you the proportion of people who inject drugs who reported any meth use in the past three months. But when we look at whether or not people also used goofballs, we can see an interesting pattern here. Among MSM, there has been some uptick in the proportion reporting goofball use, but it's modest in comparison to the trend that we see among non-MSM, where really it accounts for almost all of the increase in methamphetamine use. Now, that's not to say that people who report any goofball injection are always injecting goofballs. I've heard a lot of conflicting anecdotes from people and service providers about that. And it's something we're hoping to look at in a subsequent research study, as well as in subsequent cycles of NHBS. So as we think about how methamphetamine use might be tied to HIV risk, we need to also think about the equipment sharing component. So both of our behavioral surveys monitor this. 
when we look at just the NHB partic NHBS participants, um, we see here the proportion that report any injection um, equipment sharing is 50% among MSM and about three quarters among non-MSM. By definition, this is a little bit smaller for um, people reporting any syringe sharing. And then when we look among just the SEP clients, and this is limited to the past three months, so slightly different time periods here, um, we see, as we would guess, lower percentages of people sharing, which makes sense given that these are syringe exchange clients. However, we still see fairly non-trivial amounts of, of sharing in these populations. So keep that in the back of your head. And now we're going to answer the question of do MSM and non-MSM who inject meth share equipment with one another? So in NHBS, we have the ability to look at the characteristics of the last sharing partner for people who inject drugs. And when we, re when we restrict this to people who inject meth and share drug injection equipment, what we see is that among the MSM, about 43% of them are reporting that their last sharing partner was a non-MSM. And among non-MSM, 11% 11 report, 11 report that their last sharing partner was an MSM. So remember with that MSM group, that's where we see an HIV prevalence of about 40%. So even non-trivial rates of sharing um, are, are very concerning for us. So I'm going to shift away from HIV for just a moment and talk about how we've been monitoring hepatitis C, which is also something that Judy mentioned. Um, so she presented the data from 2015, and we've been testing or screening for hepatitis C since 2009. And you can just see extraordinarily high prevalences here um, in this population. Of course, not everybody will be chronically infected with hepatitis C, but still the majority of people, I think it's safe to say, are infected. Um, and I want to also draw your attention to two other trends here. First is the trend that Judy talked about with the, the treatment in yellow. So you can see that in 2015, it was at least encouraging that there was an uptick in treatment among people who inject drugs as a result of the new medications. Um, and then the other trend I wanted to point out is that I'm sure some of you are eyeballing the slight decline in prevalence over time. Um, so what I haven't been able to talk about is that in 2015, we made a real concerted effort to focus on young people who inject drugs. And so um, that lower prevalence is, is what we would expect because we did have a larger percentage of people who are under the age of 30. And when I adjust for age in a time trend analysis, um, the significant difference is attenuated. So it's not a real difference over time. I think it's been pretty stable, but still very high. OK, and then one of the other um, things I wanted to talk about is that, of course, we're not just focused on infectious disease outcomes, but we really want to understand the context and the environment in which people um, are living, since a lot of our folks are dealing with some very rough and chaotic lives. Um, perhaps most starkly, um, nearly 70% of people who inject drugs in our surveys report either being homeless or unstably housed. And I'm sure for those of you who have lived in the city for the past few years, you would understand that this is increasing over time. So we're seeing big um, increases in this over our survey waves. In part due to that, we have a very high percentage of people reporting that they inject in public areas. Um, so that could literally be out in the public on a sidewalk, but also places like bathrooms or libraries or places where people um, try to find some privacy, but they're still considered public areas. And 14% of people report always doing this. Other research has shown that public injection is associated with HIV risk. And then finally, um, we're also seeing what we think are some shifts in where on the body people inject um, due to some, again, very um, insightful Thoughts from our needle exchange staff, we asked about um, neck vein injection in the 2017 survey. And we're pretty surprised to see that over a third of people were reporting um, doing this at all um, over the past three months. And in fact, a very high percentage of the youngest injectors, um, almost half of people under 30, or it is half of people under 30 reported doing this. So why this is not necessarily risk for HIV, it certainly increases risk for other serious medical com um, complications. OK, this is my last data slide, and I'm trying to end on a positive note. Um, the majority of people we survey are interested in reducing or stopping their drug use. So we asked about this in 2017, and we asked about it separately for opioid, people who use opioids and people who use stimulants. And as you see, a lot of people used both, so they got two questions. 
And what you can see in green and light green is that the majority of people are either very or somewhat interested in either reducing or stopping their use. We don't ask about treatment per se, but we ask instead about reducing their use. So I think as Judy was, was saying, what our work is, um, what our task is as public health or medical professionals is to figure out the ways to best deliver this treatment um, in an effective, compassionate, and useful way um, to our clients. So returning to my four aims in summary, um, we have three independent surveillance systems that we use to monitor HIV and other outcomes. HIV incidence among um, people who inject drugs and largely among non-MSM remains low, which we're very happy about, and viral suppression remains high, which we're very happy about. Um, third, perhaps most concerning, is this increase in methamphetamine use and the potential for HIV transmission between networks that um, have high HIV prevalence and those that historically have not. And we've seen that through um, injection sharing equipment um, estimates. And then finally, I just wanted to say that um, you know, HIV is often not the highest priority for people who inject drugs. And I think some of these other um, data on other outcomes and contextual factors show that, that oftentimes housing, mental health, trying to get treatment, hepatitis C, those are the things that rise to the top of the list. So we really need to keep that in mind even when we're focused on HIV. A few data limitations. Um, of course, the generalizability of our data um, is limited to the Seattle area. And also, our surveillance surveys tend to oversample people with lower SES. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. All of our data are self-reported, so there's the potential for self, um, social desirability bias. But our staff are so good with these populations, and we really think that um, this report minimizes the risk for, for that. And then finally, um, I know to King's chagrin, now I have to announce this, that we did not look at sexual risk. Um, but that is a plan for our next, um, our next project. We also didn't have um, the ability to do a more in-depth analysis on some of the characteristics of the um, equipment sharing partners. Like I would like to look at HIV status and viral suppression. We didn't have the power to do that. So we're hoping with this um, survey that we're doing right now, we'll hopefully have some more statistical power to be able to look at that in more detail. So stay tuned. Finally, um, I just wanted to say that in the health department, a lot of our work is through our syringe exchange program. And we've been expanding the services in our program over the past few years. Um, we've really been pushing the Loxone to prevent opioid overdose. We've instituted a um, buprenorphine treatment program within the needle exchange, um, which has um, been very popular. There's a waiting list, and um, the paper on those results is in the queue right now. Um, we've also, in the past few months, expanded to provide reproductive health services for people with female reproductive organs. And so that's exciting. And on our wish list, of course, would be to add hepatitis C treatment and possibly prep pe for people who would be most likely to benefit from that. And then finally, a group of us at the HIV SCD program are meeting, I think it's next week, um, to, to put together some goals and metrics for evaluating those goals related to substance use and HIV. And we've been doing this over the past few years with our overall HIV goals, which I'm, I've depicted just a snippet here. And I think it's been a really nice, effective, and transparent way to talk about our progress and look at the goals that we're meeting and where we're falling short. And so we're hoping to develop a, a sister dashboard focused on substance use. So stay tuned for that. OK. I wanted to thank my mentors and um, colleagues at UW and public health, CDC, and then, of course, all of the participants who are so gracious with their time and stories and data. So thank you to them. And I had to copy Judy with her kid picture. Right. So you've basically described the grant that I'm working on. <laughs> um, but I can tell you what I've been hearing anecdotally and some of the hypotheses that have been bounced around. So as far as the um, motivations and the reasons for the increasing meth use, I've heard a couple of things. One is more of a, a systems level issue where basically 
Heroin's been coming up from Mexico for some time, and now methamphetamine is being manufactured there as well. And so there's just a you know, parallel channel of drugs up to the Pacific Northwest. So I think that's a bigger systems issue, reason why there might be um, more methamphetamine use, whereas it used to be you know, just made in meth labs out in the country, or in Iowa, where, where I grew up. Um, and then the, the more individual level reasons that we've heard from, from clients and participants is that you know, so many of them are homeless. They're living on the street. They're um, either trying to stay awake to keep their things safe. They're trying to stay awake to make money, to buy heroin. And so they just get into the system of using methamphetamine to stay awake and stay alert and, and try to get more money and stay safe. Um, and so I think it's largely tied to our homelessness epidemic as well. And then your second question was about treatment. And I'm really interested to know how our co-epidemics of meth and heroin um, will affect um, what you're describing, um, the uh, OAT. And I know that past research has shown that people using other stimulants have a different, um, have different um, outcomes when on methadone, for example. Um, I don't know if that data has been reproduced with with methamphetamine as well. I'm sure Dr. Altiz could answer that question better than I can. But thank you. Yeah, Lori. Thanks, Rosa. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, were you able to um, maintain your skin analysis on different grades and Did you say by race? By race. Um, I have not looked at that. Um, we certainly could. Um, and I'd be happy to share that with you. But I, I, I didn't do that for this. Mm, yeah, we, um, and, well, I guess on the one hand, unfortunately, we, we don't have huge numbers of people of color in either of these surveys. On the other hand, we have a lot of surveys now, so we might be able to do some sort of multi-year um, joint analysis. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to see any uh, examples of Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Sure. I mean, I kind of started my work thinking about adolescence, so it would help kind of bring back to that. Um, I, I think a lot of people don't know this is happening. I think a lot of people don't understand this resurgence in methamphetamine use, although it was on the front page of the New York Times um, in the past few months. So I think it's starting to get more national attention. And um, I think it's a really good idea to consider. Thanks. A brief break okay. for people to get